To give you a little bit of information, PASS is a much larger organization than just PASS Summit. We have new for this year, PASS Pro Membership, which is a paid membership service where you can access exclusive content related to things that are of interest to data professionals. We also have local user groups. I'm based out of Atlanta. We have an Atlanta lo local user group. However, most of our user groups are currently offering services virtually, which is a little different from how we normally do things. So hopefully once uh, coronavirus and this pandemic gets a little calmed down, we can actually start meeting in person again. But for now, our local user groups are there and available, and they're great networking resources if you want to get familiar with people in your area who knew, know more about the job market or essentially what companies are looking for, what skills they may need. There's also SQL Saturdays. These are also all throughout the world. Once again, in Atlanta, we actually have two of these. We have our regular one and then one for BI. These are great learning events, and right now most of these are virtual as well, so you don't have to be somewhere to attend them right now. We also have pass marathons. These are usually smaller, multiple hour, sometimes 24 hour uh, arrangements of sessions that are geared towards a particular topic. Sometimes that's DevOps or architecture but they're all geared towards something that may be of interest to you. And then usually we actually have a 24 hours of pass leading up to the pass event where it's nonstop 24 hour presentations of speakers that are actually speaking at pass. We have pass virtual groups and these are really great for very specific topics. So if you're interested in high availability and disaster recovery, there's a group for that. If you're interested in women in technology, there's a group for that. If you're interested in DevOps, there's that group as well. So feel free to check all of those out. And if you are really finding that PASS is, is working for you or you just really like to volunteer, you can also go ahead and become a volunteer for PASS. Now, before we get started on the session, I'm sure you've attended several sessions already at PASS Virtual Summit 2020 but please remember to, to fulfill your session evaluation. These are really important to the speakers. It helps us know what we're doing well and what we can improve. And it also helps the past selection committee make sure that they're getting the right speakers for you at these events. Please submit these by Friday, November 20th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to have a chance at getting some of the prizes that are available this year. Once again, my name is Elizabeth Noble and my pronouns are she and her. I come from an exclusively database development background. Right now I work for a retail company. They're a do-it-yourself used auto parts to about 25 retail locations. So that's really where most of my perspective comes from. I came to the database world from operations, business operations, not IT operations. So I do tend to look at things through the eye of how can I make sure that this is the best for the company and that this minimizes downtime for all parties involved. If you want to reach out to me, I'm on LinkedIn at elizabeth.a.noble and you can also follow me on Twitter at SQL Zelda. I became an MVP a little over a month ago, October 1st of 2020, so that's something new as well. And one of the reasons I'm giving this talk is because I love automating database deployments. I want to automate everything about them, to be honest. I want to automate the script review and making sure that things meet coding standards. And so I look at these from all sorts of different perspectives, unit testing. And so this is one of my fresh takes on how can we use feature flags to help improve the overall deployment process. And my general goal is to do what I can to reduce the stress associated with our roles, particularly around deployments. When I'm not working and when I'm not in my home office, I'm hanging out with one of my three Huskies. We've got three Siberian Huskies, two are gray and white, and they're both girls. And then we've got a boy who's an Australian Shepherd and Siberian Husky mix. And they do really good at keeping us all busy and making sure that we're getting at least a somewhat a regular amount of exercise outside of the house with proper social distancing and all of that. So what we're here to talk about today is feature flags. And really where this came from is we had uh, something that my development team was working on. Well, not my development team, a development team at my company. And they were 
designing something. It was ready to go. They had shown it off to the business unit and the business unit had come back and said, that is some really great work, but we're not ready to deploy it. Now, to give you a little bit of background where I'm at, it's really important for us being part of a retail environment that our store staff is comfortable with new changes that are coming out. That they're trained and that they know how to answer customer questions. So oftentimes we get asked to develop something, we get a deadline, and then sometimes that deadline actually gets extended, not because of us, but because of training that needs to happen. And so this was the exact scenario we found ourselves in, is we were ready to deploy a change, let's say next Wednesday. But our company wanted the change to go into effect on the first of the month. And maybe we didn't have an, a deployment scheduled that time. So that's really where the issue comes in is do you change your release process and when you deploy code to make sure that you're deploying exactly when the business needs it? Or is there another way around that sort of scenario? That's what we're going to look at today. So to give you a brief idea of the agenda, we're gonna give a general overview of feature flags, what they are, maybe not get so much into how they work. We're gonna look at that more in the process section. And then we're gonna spend most of our time going over some real life scenarios or one big real life scenario of what, what it would look like to implement a feature flag end to end. So our overview, what are feature flags? Well. Feature flag is kind of a fancy name for let's toggle some functionality associated with some code. So it's the option to turn something on or off. Now, once again, in my company, we have something like this already in place that we leave in place forever and ever. So just know when you're thinking about feature flags, this isn't just limited to getting rid of deprecated code or implementing new functionality. For instance, we've got 25 retail stores. And sometimes, depending on what state those stores are in, they have different regulations that they have to, to work around or they have different needs for their applications. So we use this same sort of feature flag concept to enable or disable based on the region they're in. So that may be something else to consider when you're looking at this type of code. Now, I will say the way we're implementing feature flags today is not how we're using it for those what we call application rules. Those are more on the application side. But I just want you to be aware, this is more flexible than maybe the scenario you're going to see today. The concept is, with a feature flag, is that if you develop your code to use feature flags, or your T-SQL code specifically for these scenarios, to use feature flags, you're going to be able to keep your regularly scheduled deployment. That's going to be absolutely no problem. And you're going to deploy when you're used to deploying, and you get to control when that gets turned on and off. This is also really helpful if you're introducing some new functionality and you're not certain how well it's gonna work and you might want a way to quickly turn off that functionality as well. So this does kind of allow for a quick rollback in your functionality if you've gone ahead and tested everything. So where can feature flags be used? Well, there's a few places you can use them. Now we're gonna focus primarily on database objects and we're gonna focus primarily on stored procedures today. But there are many different ways you can use feature flags and I'm gonna use a, a, an example with an insert, but these are good for selects and all sorts of different things. You can also use them on functions. And I would say depending on your comfort level with them and your discipline as an IT department, you probably could use them to help change the table design and the functionality of your applications as part of that overall process. Now, the reason I say you've gotta be disciplined is one of the big drawbacks, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, is what can happen if you don't stay on top of those feature flags. Besides the database objects, you can also use feature flags within SSIS packages. This can include the tasks that are options in SSIS packages and the different objects inside of the data flow. So one of the places that we've had success using feature flags in SSIS packages is we had some, some tasks that were syncing data from our various servers, and we wanted to quit syncing certain things but we wanted to do it in a staggered kind of way. So we've got multiple production environments we deploy to, and we kind of wanted to control 
how those were getting deployed. So what we did is we created a feature flag that we could toggle by server essentially with how that functionality was going to work. Was that functionality going to flow through and be as it always was, or was that functionality going to be disabled? And then finally, you also have the option of using feature flags within SSRS reports. Now, this isn't something I've tried, and I know that SSRS reports are kind of on the outs with Power BI coming into play, but SSRS reports are still really big at the company that I'm at. So kind of where I think that you can think about using these feature flags is you can use them in your data sets, and that may be more about using a stored procedure back to those database objects that pulling that information in. So maybe your data set isn't quite changing as much as it is, but really where I think it could be helpful is as a parameter where you're pulling those values or hiding hiding those columns or, or something based on those feature flags. So you can kind of toggle that functionality that users are going to see as they move on. So we've covered where you're going to want to use feature flags, but we haven't really talked about how you're going to use feature flags. One of the places that you're going to use feature flags is within your database. You're going to create tables where those feature flags are going to live, and you're going to control in those tables how those feature flags are going to work. And that's what we're going to cover today, is we're going to cover how to use tables with your feature flags because I honestly come from much more of a database perspective. I'm not an application person, but it is entirely possible to have feature flags within your config file and use those within your application. Now that's a little fancy for my side, but if you really like what you see here, I suggest you go talk to your development team and see how they feel about it and see if they're willing to kind of embrace that sort of perspective. So, I'm sure you're you're looking forward to, to hearing, you know, why would you do this? Well, you know, a big reason why we're going to use feature flags is to make our lives easier. It's kind of difficult when you deploy something and it doesn't work out the way you expected. You come in the next morning, you're being asked to roll back, and there's a whole bunch of changes that are all happening all at once. There's more testing. There's a whole bunch of stress. And I'll be honest, the number one thing I'm trying to get rid of in my day-to-day -day life is stress. Because if I can find a way to stress about it, I will. So feature flags are going to let you make those quick changes where you can almost flip a switch and that functionality will, will flip one way or another. And that's really the goal, is those quick changes. Now the other thing is, you can remove dependencies on the deployment process. And this is what's going to help your relationship with the business is the business doesn't like to hear that they can't have the functionality working on the first of the month because it doesn't work with your deployment cycle. They want to have it when they want it, right? And a lot of times things like the first of the month, first of the quarter, 15th of the month, those are dates and times that make sense to the business, but they don't always make sense to us to have our deployments at that time. And if you're not ready to change your deployment cycle, using these feature flags can help you kind of work around that. And so that's really what we're going to try to do is, is help that stress and that conversation, that dialogue with the business units in our company. Now, that doesn't mean that feature flags don't come without some sort of drawback. And for us, the drawbacks are going to be a little concerning. Um, they're not the end of the world, and they're things that you can work around, but you gotta, you got to be prepared for what's going to happen as part of this process. So if you're going to use the feature flags inside of T-SQL, one of the things that's going to happen is your code in T-SQL, while the feature flag is in place, is going to look a little messy. It's not going to be clean and streamlined and simple. It's going to have a little bit going on. So you've got to be prepared for that. You've got to make sure that your team's prepared for that. And if you need to have comments or changes to coding standards, you kind of need to consider that as well. The other big thing is you need to have discipline. Now, the demos I'm going to show you in a little while are all using continuous integration. And it's because I've found implementing continuous integration really helps a team develop discipline. Now, I'm not saying you have to have continuous integration to use feature flags. You certainly don't. But the thing is, is that once those feature flags get out in production, it's kind of like any sort of hotfix or, 
you know, band-aid that's been put in production. It's really hard to undo it if you don't have a solid process. And what I've found is, is typically getting your database code into a CI-CD sort of pipeline helps you develop that overall process and structure, and so it makes it easier to follow through with this. But you're going to see that if you don't follow up on cleaning up your feature flags, how it's going to cause that cluttered code to stay around a lot longer than you want it to. And you may have some unexpected surprises if somebody comes through and starts trying to clean up the data in your database and being helpful. So now that we've gone over a little bit about why you would use feature flags, the other topic we're going to discuss before we get into our demo is what does that look like? What does that overall process feel like? So our current deployment process should be pretty simple. You're going to write your code. Hopefully you're using database source control. If you're not, that's okay. But you're going to write your code. It's going to go through a QA process. It's going to get assigned to a deployment. And then on the deployment date, that's when it's going to get deployed. So that code is going to get sent out into production. So let's say I'm implementing some new functionality and I write some code for that new functionality. It goes through QA, it goes through lower environments, and then it gets assigned to a deployment. Well, once that new functionality gets assigned to a deployment, it gets deployed. It's out, it's out there. It's working. That's how it's intended, right? Is once it gets deployed, it's working. What we're trying to do is handle the situations where it isn't quite that simple. So, for instance, let's say you need to deploy the code on the first. You begrudgingly say, okay, I'm going to deploy the code on the first. It's a Thursday. We normally don't deploy on Thursdays, but I'm going to go ahead and do that deployment. And you deploy the code on a Thursday. Let's say Thursday night for Friday morning, right? So now you're in Fridays, that day that everybody jokes about we shouldn't do any changes. And let's say the code goes out Friday morning and all of a sudden you find out the company isn't ready for it or how they thought it was going to work isn't how it's working. And they come to you and they tell you they need a rollback. Well, now you've already done one deployment out of process and now you've got to roll back some code out of process. So now you better do another deployment right in the middle of the day, right in the the heart of everything. Well, that's going to make it even more stressful, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid the stress of those multiple deployments of doing things off cycle. So this is kind of what the new flow is going to look like. Now, some of this stuff, particularly the first one, is something you're only going to have to do once, and that's creating a feature flag table. This is to store all the information about all the feature flags that are out in your environment right now. The second thing is when you start doing your development process, you're going to need to insert a record into this feature flag table. And you're going to need to insert it with potentially it in a disabled state. And then you're also going to need to test it in the enabled state. So you're going to kind of have to go back and forth about how all this functionality works. You'll go ahead and update the code to use the feature flag. It's going to go through the QA process. It's going to get assigned to a release. It's going to get deployed, except when it gets deployed, it's going to get deployed as inactive. That feature flag will not be active. And then when you're ready to turn it on, so say your deployments are on Wednesday nights, not Thursday nights. You do the deployment Wednesday night, Thursday night or Friday morning, you flip the switch and you enable that feature flag. And now that functionality is out there. Remember, I told you the code's going to get a little messy. So the issue is the feature flag's enabled, everything's working as expected, but now you've got to kind of declutter your code. So you're going to have to do another deployment where you remove that feature flag. And when you remove that feature flag, you're basically going to leave the new code and only the new code and get rid of that sort of feature flag kind of concept out of the code. And so that's really where the discipline comes in is it come it's very important to make the user story to go back and clean up the feature flag and then schedule that user story and maybe make sure you don't schedule it so close to the release that you get rid of the functionality too soon, but don't wait so long that everybody's used to having that clunky code out in production. All right, so we've covered what feature flags are about 
and a general guideline of what the flow of using feature flags is going to look like. So let's talk about that. So with our database changes, we've got a couple options. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus on stored procedures today. So stored procedures are where we can release the code today and we can make it so that we can control when that code gets used in the future. Now, using feature flags for tables is a bit trickier and not intended to be covered today because that's a, a very lengthy conversation and it does involve at least one of my least favorite things, triggers. Now, I don't hate triggers for everything, but I do think there's a place for them and mostly it has to do with auditing, but this may be another good use. But once again, you want that discipline if you're going to enable that sort of behavior. So let's go over, before we get too far into things, let's go over what the current deployment process looks like and then we'll come back and we'll look at how to implement those feature flags on our end. All right, so we've got Azure Data Studio going on. So I am connecting to my server and I've got a database forecast. So what I'm really focused on today is it's going to be this vendor table, but it's really going to be this stored procedure post vendor. So my goal is to take this stored procedure, which I'm going with the scenario of we created the stored procedure to get it out the door. And so we did the bare minimum that we needed to deploy the stored procedure. So the bare minimum we needed was to have a stored procedure pass in a vendor name and a payment date to create our vendor. So that's what we've got is we've got this insert statement where we're going to pop, we're going to populate the vendor name, the address, the city, the state, the zip code, and the payment date. And as you can see, I'm only actually putting values in the vendor name and the payment date. And that's because we didn't quite like in this scenario, we didn't quite have the system set up to handle passing in those other values. And so this is where we're at today. So I want to do a brief example of what that looks like. So we'll open a new query window. I'm actually going to So let's just select everything from the vendor table and I've got some stuff out here. So just know that we're going to start with record five. So when I run this stored procedure, I'm only passing in two values and you can see record five, I populated Acme company and a payment date of the third. So that's where we're starting. Now the request is that instead of doing it this way, they want to be able to pass in all the values into the post vendor table or into the vendor table. So we've got to update the post vendor stored procedure to allow us to pass all the values in. So I'm going to go ahead and I also have Azure Data Studio hooked up to my Git source control. In this case, I'm using Azure DevOps source control, but you can also use GitHub source control from here. So if your company is using either one of those, you can absolutely connect your database project, only your database project to this. Now I will say I've given presentations on using source control for databases before. And one of the concerns has been using database source control in Visual Studio. And there's been kind of a concern about not wanting to have to use Visual Studio or that's not a tool that database administrators should use. So this Azure Data Studio option is really a great option if you'd prefer to stay kind of in the SQL Server Management Studio SMS kind of world. This is an SMS, this is an SSMS, but it is Azure Data Studio and it is, the, you know, the close cousin of SSMS. And one of the things that, you know, Microsoft is trying to get us more familiar with using as DBAs. So I'm a big fan of source control. It's one of the reasons that I want to use it for this presentation today. So we're going to go ahead and 
we're going to create a branch. And if you're not familiar with branches, don't get too worried about it. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking a copy of the database code that should be out in production. And I'm going to work on this own, my own little copy where I don't mess anybody else up. That's really the concept of using branches. So we're going to call this uh, current deploy just so we can keep it straight. And as you can see, the name changed right there to current deploy. And if I go here, I've got my database. This is my database project down here. And if you're not familiar, you've got folders. This is the build schema with stored procedures and tables. And this is a security schema where it actually has some information about the build schema in there. But I can also work on this, this editor section up here directly. So here's my current code as it stands. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this process and I'm going to pretend like I don't know anything about feature flags. and I'm just trying to get this done as fast as possible. So in this case, the fastest possible way to get this done is to go ahead and update the stored procedure. I'm going to pass in all these values. And one of the things I can do if I really want to be like super careful is I can make these so they're nullable. Um, but I will say the reason I can't do that in this scenario, I forgot, is that my columns are null and nullable on my table. So that is not a possibility. Um, but I could make them blank, but we're not going to get sidetracked on that right now. So here is the change to my code. And I've gone ahead and I've made that change. And if you see right here, it actually says that M, it means it's been modified. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the behind the scenes on kind of how that continuous integration world looks like if you're not familiar with it. So hopefully you'll, you'll learn to kind of appreciate the same way I do. So we are going to update the post vendor to include all values, include all parameters, columns, about that. So that's just my little note to myself and anybody else so they know what's happening and why we're doing what we're doing. So with if you've never used Git before, one of the first things you do is you save this stuff locally. And then once it's saved locally, I have the option to send that change up to my repository in the cloud, in this case, Azure DevOps. Now, I've never sent this branch up to the cloud, so I actually have the option to publish changes, not sync. And it should go ahead and create that branch. So it says action, push and pull, and we're going to say yes. We just want to make sure everything is going up there. So now I'm going to go into Azure DevOps, go to my, this is my forecast project, which is what we're working on. And if you see right here, it's got this little timer. It means it's about to start building my project. So it is going to take a couple seconds. I've got a whole pipeline set up, and we're not going to cover that today because that's not the purpose of this session. But we will kind of watch it go through. I do kind of like watching all the checkboxes. It's, uh, it is kind of rewarding, particularly when you're having one of those days where nothing seems to be going quite right. Um, but this does take, I would say, about a minute and a half to two minutes. And we are recording this live. So while this is a recorded session, you're going to have like all the timing and everything else happening real time so that you can see how long this overall process takes. And this is a little database. I will say we've got some databases uh, in my company that have multiple dependencies. And it can take about 8 to 10 minutes to build those, which may seem like a huge bummer. Um, but that's kind of how it works. I'm sure there's ways to do it faster, but we've all kind of learned to be a little patient. If you see here, this is VS build. This is the same thing as building your project locally, which I should have done before I synced my code. And hopefully I'll remember to do that when we go through our scenario of what it looks like to use feature flags. So part of this is I'm using Azure DevOps for my release process as well. And so in order to use Azure DevOps for my release, I need to make sure that I have what's called an artifact available for Azure DevOps. So once again, not entirely the, the purpose of this session, 
but I really did want to kind of show you how easy this overall process can be when you're using feature flags and you've got all those different pieces set up. So this shouldn't take too terribly long. As I said, this is taking about a minute to two minutes and it looks like we're gonna be finished in just a second here. So the next step, and I'm gonna go ahead and update this and it should update in a second with a release branch. As you can see, it's trying to deploy right now. That's what that blue spinny circle means. So it's in progress and it's got the same sort of details. So there aren't very many steps. It's downloading the changes that I've made. And then this last step is it's gonna deploy that to the database. And what's interesting to know here, I'm not, I don't have a, my database in the cloud, but this database is on a different server or a different machine in my home network. So now that we've gotten that deployed, we can go back here and we can refresh the code and we can see under stored procedures that that code has changed. And you can see it's passing in the address, city, state, zip code, and then it's going ahead and inserting the address, city, state, and zip code. Now this is all great, but remember, my boss didn't want this code working quite yet. So this isn't really the option I wanted because this is the way we're used to doing it. So just wanted to cover that just so, you know, in case you weren't familiar with the automated process, but that felt kind of familiar. And just real quick while we're here, I'm gonna go back and I'm going to essentially reset my environment to what it used to be. And one of the ways I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna take the main branch and I'm just gonna redeploy it out onto my development environment. Okay, so we've got all that going. We've got it getting updated, but in the meantime, I'm gonna go back to my main branch and then I'm gonna create another new branch and I'm gonna call this feature flag. I can't quite see my keyboard, but that's okay. All right, so now we're in the new branch feature flag. And if I go here and I open it up, you see it doesn't have the changes I had before. That's kind of one of the benefits of working with branches. So now we're ready to make our changes. So I've got this script file saved over here, but one of the things is I can't quite use it yet because if I put it in there and I try to use it, it's not gonna like me. And I'll show you what happens in case you've never seen this because this is actually one of the reasons I really kind of like working with database projects. So I'm gonna try to build this and it should give me a build error because I'm referencing this object right here that doesn't exist. See that right there? It's referencing this table build feature flag. Now it says the build succeeded, but it's also got these three warnings because it's referencing this object that it can't find. So post vendor has an unresolved reference to object and build feature flag. So that's kind of our warning right there. So what we need to do is we need to create a new table. Now I've found the easiest way to do this is to use the projects section because one of the things that's kind of tricky about database projects is this SQL project file has an XML listing of all the objects it's going to deploy. And so you need to make sure that XML listing gets updated with your new table. So in our case, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click add table and then I'm gonna give it the name feature flag And then you see right here, it automatically creates this table for me, which is not very helpful for what I'm trying to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to put my table there. So we've got the bill feature flag, and then we've got our various columns. So we've got the feature flag ID, and I try to get my indenting correct, but it looks like it's a little off. Um, we've got our identity column, the is active, the date created, the date modified, and then this primary key. So it's a simple little table. It's gonna go ahead and save that. As you can see right here, the SQL project file has been modified. And then you've got this untracked change on this feature flag table. So we've got these changes going on. And remember, I've already saved this change. Now I did this really fast. So let's walk through what this code is doing because this is the special feature flag stuff. 
So we're going to start at the bottom. This is what is already there in production. So this is the currently working code. And what we're doing is we're wrapping in an, an if else statement. And that's why I said it's going to get a little clunky and you're not going to love it, but it's not intended to be long term. And that's why it's depending on your environment. OK to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if the feature flag is active for feature flag ID one, we are making it make it a big guess right there. And how you want to handle that on your own is that's a, a more esoteric conversation than I'm going to have today. But because I know that I'm the first person to make this table, I know the first record in it will be my feature flag because it's in my branch. Um, so which is not a hundred percent true, but we're going to go with all those assumptions for today. So we're going to assume I'm the first person to put the feature flag in there and that that feature flag is specifically for this scenario. So if it's active, then it'll be one. And if one equals one, then run this code. So essentially if I make a feature flag and the feature flag is toggled as enabled or active, go ahead and run the new code. If there is no feature flag or if the feature flag is disabled, it's going to run the pre-existing code. That's the whole magic behind feature flags. Not too, not too out of line, but as I said, it does kind of clutter up that nice streamlined looking code that we had before. So I'm just going to make sure to save that change again. And then you can see here, I've got my three files that have been changed. So we're going to implement feature flags. to make our enhancement, right? OK. Um, three characters. Are, we'll just say enhance. Um, there we go. All right. And I'm going to automatically stage and commit my changes. That's kind of how we're used to doing it at work. Uh, I would say go with whatever method your entire company is kind of implementing. That's my usual strategy for working with database source control is my goal is to make sure it's consistent with the other teams. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to sync that up. And this is going to go through the same process that we just saw. So remember, we walked through the process for our current deploy. Now we're going to walk through that process on our new method. So I'm going to close out of this. And while everything's running, because it does take a few minutes, we're going to refresh this. And I'm just going to show you that right now, that code isn't out there, so that table isn't there. And the stored procedure is probably, it's the old stored procedure. So that's where we're starting from. So let's go check the status of that process. So we've got our pipeline, and it's currently building right now. OK. So we're about 22 seconds in, so this is going to take another minute or so which is OK. And I don't know if you noticed, when you look here, it shows you like the most recent run. You can actually look at uh, all runs, which it looks like because of this branch, it's only showing one. Uh, yeah, here you go. So here, there's a way to see the listing of all the various runs that have happened. So that's another kind of nice feature, depending on how you feel about uh, these pipelines. And then once again, if you kind of like just having like this is my localized view, you can see here this says forecast and you see this little icon with the line down a line to the right. That's usually what happens when it's hooked into um, Azure DevOps for your repo. Otherwise, it's got a little GitHub icon. But I figured I'd keep this all the same. And you see here we're getting some warnings. If you've never really dealt with database source control. This is actually one of my favorite things about database source control is these warnings that it tells you about. Now it's still running. It's still got things going on. But as you can see, it's almost finished again. So we're almost ready to basically look at how that feature flag worked out and how it got implemented. Um, just a few more up oh, the jobs checked. So I just kind of blinked and it all cleared up. So we've got our deployment going on. And once again, there's several different ways to look at this deployment process. You can watch it here. Uh, 
it already it went so fast that it's already done so we'll go look at that code again so i'm going to refresh on forecast just make sure i've got the most up-to-date stuff you see i've got this feature flag table now and i've also got let me just kind of look at the stored procedure so if i look at the stored procedure now i have the option of these feature flags now we talked about the fact that there is no feature flag right now so for instance if i go run this code again well, first of all, we'll see what happens when I run this code again. So when I run this code again, it doesn't work anymore. So that is kind of one of the the hiccups is if I had set like default parameters to blank, this would still work. Um, so let's just take a second and let's go let's go do that real quick because we've got a little bit of time. So that one was already populated. But let's say we wanted it to make make it work like it always has. So we're just gonna make the default for these values blank. And then let's go ahead and build our project again. And I'm actually going to, I'm gonna clear this and build it again just so we get a nice clean screen. And you see here the build succeeded, zero warning, zero errors. And that's what we like to see. And then, um, Cap locks, caps lock key. All right, update for default parameters. And I want to do that because I really want you to see that in, in concept, the feature flag does let you keep all that functionality exactly as it was. Okay, so that's building and deploying. And what we're going to do is we're going to work on updating the feature flag while that deployment is going through. And then we'll come back and run this in just a second. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to open another new query. And we've got some code for our feature flags. So the first thing I want to do is I want to insert my feature flag and I want to insert my feature flag as in active because remember when I go live it's going to be inactive now normally when you're doing testing you're gonna go from inactive to active or active to inactive and back and forth and make sure that that functionality works but right now we're assuming that that's already been tested and approved and so as part of our production deployment we're gonna make sure that we insert that feature flag as inactive so I'm gonna go ahead and insert that record and then let's see what that feature flag looks like, which looks like I don't have that query handy. All right, so we've got our feature flag. So you see here, feature flag ID one, which is what we were assuming. And then we've got an is active of zero, which is what we were expecting. Now, before we go any further, I want to make sure that how that deployment's coming along. So we're going to go check on our pipelines. That one's finished. And then this pipeline is just finishing up right now. So when it finishes, we'll go back and we'll check and make sure that our stored procedure with our new parameter defaults is working as expected. So this shouldn't take too long, and I'm pretty sure by the time I click on it, yeah, it'll finish right up. So back to Azure Data Studio we go, and we're going to just refresh one more time just to make sure that we've got the most up-to-date stuff going on. And when I right-click on this, I'm going to script it as create again. I might not have clicked it all the way through. And we'll just select refresh again. Looks like my connection may be being funky. Oh, there we go. Got it open a few times now. All right, so we've got the default values happening with the blank being selected for address one. Oh, and I forgot it for zip code. So <laughs> it's going to be one of those days. Um, so we will go ahead and get that through for zip code just really quick. That's why they tell you not to type in live demos and these are even pre-recorded ones, but that is all right. Quick build. 
And you notice it's really not taking too terribly long to get those changes down. So we'll go ahead and get that updated. Alrighty. And go back to our database. And it is going to take just a couple minutes for that to show up. Um, once again, as a reminder, what we have in the vendor table so far is five records. So when we start looking at these, we're going to start looking starting at record six. So we've got a got a few minutes to get there, and I'm going to close this one out because we've already we've kind of kind of gone past that scenario. So let's go check on these pipelines. This one should still be going. Yeah, it's only 28 seconds into it. So it's going to be a couple minutes, but it's worth it to make sure that we get some accurate examples of how we want those feature flags to work. So we'll just let this kind of finish on with what it's doing. And just remember, so we're using the feature flags for database projects and we're using the feature flags with, we're creating tables to store the feature flag information inside the database. And so that lets us dynamically control when those feature flags are going to be enabled and disabled. And so we're, we're getting our stored procedures set up so that I can show you a, a proper test where we originally executed this exact same stored procedure, execute build.postvendor at vendor name equals Acme company, comma, at payment date equals three. We're making sure that our new post vendor stored procedure maintains that exact same functionality. And so if this is what was passed to that stored procedure, it would still insert a record and it wouldn't fail. And so that's why we're taking this extra time to get our code deployed, because that's just how important it is to make sure that this is working as expected. And so we've got our release pipeline going. It's going to be just a couple minutes. Um, and if you're not familiar with Azure DevOps, if you don't like these names, release 95 and these pipeline names uh, with the date and the dot, there's a whole bunch of fancy ways to change those. So I just kind of stuck with the defaults and that's why they look the way they do. Now we've gotten confirmation that this has been deployed. We're going to go ahead and refresh one more time. And then we're going to go to our table or stored procedure. And now we've got it updated and you can see now we have the proper default values for each of these. So the concept is the feature flag, let's just refresh, the feature flag is feature flag ID one, and it's currently disabled. We checked the code, where's the code, yep. We checked the code, and so what's happening is we're, pass, we're gonna pass in Acme Company and three, but right here, this query, select is active from build.featureFlag, where feature flag ID equals one, that's actually going to return a zero and zero doesn't equal one. So it should go to this next step right here. And so now if I run this query on line six, I should see the exact same thing. But if we want to implement that new functionality we were talking about, let's just try that new functionality. So let's say, let's say we're ready to start passing the data in but they're not ready to, they're, we're not ready to store it. So the application's ready to send it, but we're not ready to store it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and update this last section right here. So in this case, I can run this exact same stored procedure where I'm going to insert a record into line seven. And since the feature flag is disabled, it should not store address one, city, state, or zip code. So I'm going to run it again, and on line seven, you see it did not store the address, city, state name, or zip code. So that's exactly how we expect it to work. So now that we've we've had the code out in production, we've test tested that the code is not working because we don't want it enabled yet, which is exactly how we want it. Now we're ready. Maybe it's the first of the month. Maybe it's the Friday they want the code enabled. So now we're ready to flip it and we're ready to enable that feature flag. So we're going to go back and we're going to enable the feature flag. And here we go. We're going to confirm the feature flag is enabled. And now 
if I run this stored procedure and I query from the table, we're going to see it did store my address, city, and state because my feature flag was enabled. So it started using this code, right? So now we could leave this code like this. We could leave this code like this far, far, far longer than we would want to. But that would defeat the purpose of putting the feature flags out there because we don't want a bunch of code that ends up with a bunch of if else statements. That's This is a temporary fix. Like let's call this a band-aid or a workaround. It's not a bad workaround. It's intended to be there and it's intended to be that way, just not forever. So our next steps are we have to we have to kind of put everything back kind of the way it was, but not because now we need to make sure that the stored procedure ends up in its final state, right? So we want it in its final state. So we're going to go back to source control. We're going to go back to our post vendor and we're going to remove the statement and we can even do something fancy like, you know, We can say we're going to remove the feature flag dependency on feature flag ID one, right? And then we're going to get rid of this. And now it's only the new functionality. And then for instance, if I don't want to let people insert blanks ever again, because that's bad data, then I can go through and I can change this and I can make it so they can't do that anymore because I don't want them to. So now I'm going to clear this out again. I'm going to build my project before I save my code. So just give it a couple seconds. All right, we have another build successful. So we're going to go over here and we're going to say, so now we're going to basically make sure our code is, is in our future state, right? We're going to make sure that it's always inserting those values all the time. So same process, we're going to commit our changes and then we're going to sync those up. And that, as you know, is going to take just a couple minutes for that to appear. So I'm going to close out of this so that when we open the stored procedure again and we don't get confused, I'm going to close out of this because the stored procedure is going to change again. Let's go see what's going on with our pipelines. Those are going to take just a couple minutes. So this is running right now. It's going to go ahead and go through its process. As you, you know, we've seen this several times already today. And as I said, this is a very normal part of the process. And I really enjoy the the build functionality that happens as part of having my databases and source control. This is great for situations where you may have deleted a column out of a table, but you didn't update some stored procedures. This is going to find this build process that you do either locally, preferably locally, or through this build process if you forget to build it locally like I did the first time. That's really going to solve these sorts of issues where your not having that build, you're not catching, you're not catching your errors yourself. And so the build is going to catch it for you. So we've only got a couple more seconds left uh, and it should go ahead and get this done for us. So we'll see how this goes. Just a few more seconds now. All right, and now we're on to the releases. I've got to make sure my machine's awake, so I just woke it up. All right, running through it right now. Just a few more minutes. Doing great. And now we're ready to go. So let's go back to our database project. We're going to go ahead and refresh this one more time. We're going to look at our stored procedures. And we confirmed it's only got the new code in it. So now, like if I run this one, 
it won't work. But if I run this one, it'll work. And there you go. That's record nine. After we've gone ahead and put everything back into the proper future state. So we're in a really good place here. So the final step, that was the final step. So we've gone through deploying our feature flag. So let's go back to our presentation. And we kind of skipped past the feature flag foundation and stored procedures and how to deprecate it. So we're finished. That was it. That was setting up your first feature flag. I will say it's one of those things that seems really scary at first. The first time we did it with our SQL Server Integration Services project, it did not, it seemed very intimidating. And then as we went ahead and implemented it, it became really exciting to be able to see that we could control when code was coming into and out of use, right? So we could decide when to turn something on and when to turn something off. And overall, this has made our lives really easier. Now I'll say, we still have those feature flags out in production right now, and I need to get that user story to get rid of the feature flags prioritized because right now it's just kind of making things messy. Um, but that's not something that we, that we, it, it is something we can do, you know, essentially almost any time. And so it does give us that flexibility to manage our code and control our code the way that we want to. So I really encourage you all to, first of all, consider putting your databases in source control if you're not doing so already. Consider using your CI CD, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines to make your deployments easier if you're not doing it. If you, if you weren't familiar with the method I was using, I was using database projects, which is related to SQL Server data tools, but database projects is specifically in Azure Data Studio. It does use a very particular method of deployment where it deploys essentially a database schema saved in source control to an environment. If you're not familiar with that or you prefer to use scripts, there are ways to implement feature flags using scripts and there's different deployment methods for that as well. So it's absolutely an option for you to use feature flags with whatever sort of deployment method you're using. I've just found that having those feature flags as part of the deployment process overall is really helpful for you know getting people to understand you know what's going on with the overall flow of your feature flags but at the end of the day my goal is to make sure that my life is easier and the reason that i give these presentations is because i want your life to be easier so hopefully your life is made easier by these feature flags and we can kind of come together and have you know, some really great code and some really great deployment processes. Now, don't forget, um, thank you again for attending this session and thank you for your attention throughout the session. Once again, there are session evaluations that will need to be turned in by Friday if you want to win a prize, but please turn them in at any point in time throughout past summit or by Friday. There's also a 15 minute Q&A discussion with me after this session. So if you have questions about anything in this session, if you wanna talk database DevOps or deployments, feature flags, any of that stuff, I'm, I'm definitely willing to be around, hang out, talk with you. So feel free to, to stay around. And I really hope that you all can stay focused on making your database life easier and simpler and less stressful. That's really the goal for me with any of my database projects is we've got enough stress going on in our day-to-day -day lives that anything we can do to make it easier is going to be better. So just remember that and keep that in mind. Once again, my name is Elizabeth Noble. My pronouns are she and her, and you can reach out to me on Twitter at SQL Zelda, or you can find me at LinkedIn. Please put a note if you connect with me on LinkedIn that you saw me at past summit, just so I kind of know where, where you're coming from. I, I do get a few requests and I just would like to know that, you know, I, I know who's reaching out to me. But once again, thank you for joining my session. And I really hope that you all have a great time at past summit. And I hope you see tons of wonderful sessions out there. Thank you so much.